Oh, I'm Rick Wilson, director of Ciencia. <laughs> wow. And I'll moderate today's lecture. Uh, the 2015-2016 lecture series uh, focuses on the topic of inequality. And inequality is a complex issue that touches on differences between groups across social, economic, political, cultural, and technological dimensions. Uh, at the core of inequality, of course, is political inequality, I say proudly as a political scientist. Uh, we're very lucky today to have my colleague, Dr. Leslie schwinn -Bear, uh, the Albert Thomas Associate Professor of Political Science, who's going to be speaking to us on the topic of inequality across the world. Uh, Leslie's PhD is from the University of Arizona, and we were lucky enough to have her join us in uh, 2014, in the fall. Uh, Leslie's PhD is from the University of Arizona uh, and her research is on an array of topics in comparative and Latin American politics including presidents, legislatures, elections, representation, corruption, and women and gender in politics. So she covers a wide variety of things. Uh, she's published in such journals as the American Journal of Political Science, Legislative Studies Quarterly, the Journal of Politics, the British Journal of Political Science, uh, Electoral Studies, Comparative Political Studies in Politics and Gender. Uh, she has two books on gender, politics, and power that published with Oxford University Press, and she has a third book forthcoming from Cambridge. So she's been very busy. It's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Schwinn Bayer, who's going to be speaking on gender inequality and politics around the world. Leslie. Thank you so much, Rick, um, for a nice introduction and for humoring our video. It made you seem very important. It was a nice way to, to start the lecture today. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all today about gender inequality and politics around the world. And thank you all for turning out uh, at 4 o'clock on this Tuesday afternoon to even after almost 15 years of teaching gender and politics, it still surprises me when my new to college undergraduates show up in class and balk a little bit when I start talking about gender inequality around the world. I get a lot of pushback because a lot of these students have never experienced or thought about gender or questions of gender inequality. Students today were eight years old at the time that uh, Hillary Clinton and Sarah Palin were both involved in the presidential and vice presidential elections of 2008. Um, for them, Hillary Clinton has been a fixture in politics, and so the presence of a woman has not been anything particularly unusual for them. Some of them live or come from uh, areas of the country where in their congressional districts they had a female member of Congress. Some who were from Houston note that Anise Parker has been mayor um, for the last few years here in Houston. Um, some who are interested in international politics point out the fact that Angela Merkel is almost single-handedly trying to save the EU um, from extinction currently and, um, and has played a pretty strong and significant role in European and world politics. It's also interesting when I ask students uh, at the beginning of the semester if they are feminist or not, I usually only get a very small handful of students who raise their hands. And the reason is because a lot of them have never uh, thought about or felt um, any kind of inequality. Their, their parent, parents, their schools, um, people taught them that they could do pretty much anything that they wanted to do, and so they frequently come to college feeling um, precisely that way. And I'm always surprised given where I am now and what I do now and what I study now. But when I think back to even when I was growing up in the 1980s, um, I felt pretty much the same way when I went to college. Uh, nobody had ever, had ever told me there were things that I couldn't do. I wanted to be a computer science and math major when I started my uh, undergraduate degree. Um, so I, I, I understand the perspective that students are coming from. In fact, however, what I try to teach them and what I'm going to show to you all today is the fact that gender inequality is not just a thing of the past. It, it exists in politics around the world today and it exists in nearly all political institutions. Um, it's about both the presence of women in office and their numerical representation, but it's also about how politics plays out in inside of political institutions. 
It's also about questions of both sex and gender. It's about the numbers of women and men in office, uh, but it's also about our um, social constructions of what we expect of women and men and how we categorize things that are masculine and things that are feminine. And both of those things factor into questions of um, sexual or, or sex and gender inequality in politics. My goal today is to do a couple of different things, three things to be precise. First, I want to illustrate to you the pervasive sex inequality in political institutions around the world with some statistics on the presence of women in political institutions and government institutions. Secondly, though, and perhaps more importantly, I want to highlight what research has found um, about how we explain why women are not represented in office in equal numbers to men. And thirdly, I want to move beyond beyond talking about just numbers to actually look at some questions of gender and to provide some evidence of the inequality related challenges that women face working inside of political institutions. There we go. So the last time I gave a Ciencia lecture was two years ago when they had organized uh, five minute TED Talks and they had four or five people giving five minute um, uh, presentations uh, without uh, PowerPoint slides on a topic uh, related to that particular week. And I talked a little bit about what I'm going to talk about in much more detail today. And at that time, the first thing that I did was to give a quiz to the audience and ask for um, a ask to sort of test your knowledge on women's uh, participation in politics. And so I thought it would be um, good to ask again, even though I'm sure that you all remember the answer from last time around, and I'm sure you remember everything that I talked about last time, I still thought it would be useful to ask the question again. So I want to ask the question of you all, which country has the highest representation of women in the national legislature? Guesses, yeah. It is Rwanda, exactly. So she was here last time and clearly remembered everything I said. Nice job. Yes, it is Rwanda. 64% um, of the Rwandan Congress is female. That is exceptionally high and it's actually gone up since the last time uh, I, I talked about this. Anybody know what the second uh, highest representation of women is? Guesses? Sweden, that's a very good guess. That's a very common guess. It is not Sweden. <laughs> but there are good reasons to guess that it would be Sweden. Other guesses? You didn't know I was going to make you participate today, did you? All right, I'll give you the answer. The next country is Bolivia. Bolivia has 53% of its national congress is female. These are the only two countries that have surpassed the 50% threshold. So these are the only two countries that have achieved any kind of numerical gender equality in women's representation in their national legislatures. Um, and there are uh, what else we um, and there are actually 14 countries that are at the other end of, oh, I'm sorry. Um, these are the only two countries that are above 50%, but there are 14 countries that actually have between 40% and 50% of their legislatures being female. So it's not, there are a fair number of countries that are actually getting close to 50% here as well. Um, let me talk a little bit more about women's uh, legislative representation outside of these two particular cases. Um, a couple statistics here. The worldwide average percentage of women in the legislature is 22.6%. 14 countries have no uh, or just one woman serving in their Congress, which helps to explain how you can go from 53% uh, and 63% to 22.6% um, uh, as the worldwide average. Uh, 14 countries have, have uh, next to no women in their legislatures. The United States actually ranks 95th out of 191 countries. It's not doing particularly well in terms of women's representation. Um, in the uh, House of Representatives, 19.4% uh, is female, and in the Senate, there are 20 senators, so 20% of the Senate is female. Just to show you uh, some of the other countries that do reasonably well in terms of women's representation, um, as you can see the list here, these are the top 16 countries. And you can see uh, Rwanda, Bolivia, Cuba at the top, um, all the way down to Norway. Sweden is on this list, uh, but it is uh, not the top country. And while there are countries on here that you would expect, which would be the Nordic countries, uh, the countries that we typically associate with things like gender equality, um, there are countries on this list that you would probably not expect to see near the top, the countries that we tend to associate more with gender inequality in society and in their cultures than in terms of gender equality. 
So there's wide variation across countries. There's also been significant change over time. Um, in 1945, when the Interparliamentary Union, which is the organization that's been collecting these data for many years, um, started collecting their data, they looked at 26 states in 1945, and 3% of those states had women in their, uh, or 3% or of all of those legislatures were female. Um, that's increased slowly over time. Perhaps the biggest jump occurred between 1995 and 2010, um, when the number, their percentage almost doubled. By 2016, it's up to 22.6%. There's also variation across regions of the world. Not surprisingly, the Nordic states are near the top, um, 41%. Uh, the Americas, predominantly not, uh, 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 represented by Latin America, the United States is included in that, as is Canada, um, but predominantly being driven by Latin American countries, 27%, uh, so a little bit more than a quarter of Latin American legislatures are uh, female. It drops all the way down to the Arab states and the Pacific countries, which are near the bottom of this list. So I have one more quiz for you. So let's talk a little bit about the executive branch. Anybody know which modern democracy had the first female chief executive? Yes? No. Good guess, though. No. Good guess, though. No, but close. Yes, it was Sri Lanka. Um, and I'm not going to embarrass myself by attempting to pronounce her name. Um, there's probably someone in the audience who could do it very well. Um, I don't want to, to butcher it. Um, but she was the, Sri Lanka had the first female prime minister. Um, she was elected and uh, in 1960 her husband, and this is not a surprising way for women at over the years to get into uh, chief political offices. Um, but her husband uh, was assassinated in 1959. She uh, took the Senate seat uh, afterwards and then led the party to an election victory in 1960 and then was appointed prime minister um, at that point in time. She served a second term from 1970 to 1977 as well. So a surprising country uh, as the chief executive. This won't surprise anyone. If we look at the context of the United States, um, it's very clear that the US has never had a female president. And I have to tell you that I'm reminded of this uh, at breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day because I have a six-year-old uh, little boy at home who has a placemat with the presidents and their pictures and all the information about them on it. And so every meal, we sit down and we talk about the presidents every day. And so every day, I see this, this placemat with pictures of men and not a single woman on there. And I'm looking forward to the day that um, a, a female president does get elected in the United States. And what I'm hoping is that they push all the male pictures away and put a big picture of her right in the middle um, until the time comes that, that there are enough women that we can start to scatter them through the placemat. Um, in my opinion, that would look very nice. So no women have been president of the United States. That's not a surprise to everyone in here. Um, in terms of women chief executives worldwide, women have held this office. Uh, more than 54 women through 2010 have um, held either the presidency or the prime minister in a country. But as Thames and Williams point out to us in their 2013 book, women served as the executive of the country in a mere 3% of the 159 democracies that were represented in their data set that covered the years of 1945 to 2006. And more than half of those women served in the position on an interim basis, meaning that they were appointed for a very short period of time um, just to cover the office while they were waiting for a new election to be held, um, for, a new, for a new election to be held. So women's representation in executives has also been very, very small. One region of the world that's been a bit of an exception to this is Latin America. Um, since 1990, between 1990 and 2016, uh, Latin America has had six female presidents, and they've actually served a total of nine times. Three of those female presidents were actually re-elected, either immediately or after sitting out for a term. Uh, in the 2010 to 2014 election cycle, 15% of candidates were viable female candidates. This is very small, but, it's act but it also shows that women have held these positions to some degree. In other parts of the government, um, we see similarly small numbers. Cabinets worldwide in 2011, only 16% of uh, cabinets were comprised of women. Uh, in the United States specifically, the cabinet, these were all data from 2015, four of 16 cabinet posts were held by women, so a quarter of the cabinet was female. Governors, 12%, uh, so six out of 50. 
in 2015. Mayors, 19% of the uh, 100 largest cities uh, had a female mayor. <coughs> You also see, see similar inequality in courts, political parties, city councils, and other political institutions in countries around the world. So the key point that I want to make here with these data is that there is co uh, considerable gender inequality still in lots of different political institutions in lots of, di of different countries around the world. The next question that's a, uh, an important question to ask is why? Why do women lag behind men in nearly all political contexts? And here the concept of gender comes into play a little bit more. So far we've just sort of been talking about the numbers of women in these political offices. But gender, referring to the ways in which male and female and masculine and feminine have been socially constructed to mean certain things, starts to matter for understanding women's underrepresentation in politics. We have to start paying attention to things such as stereotypes and biased perceptions of women and what they should do and what they shouldn't do, um, and how women's and men's roles have been traditionally characterized and how that obstructs women's access to political power. What I want to do here is to illustrate what research uh, that has been conducted on trying to explain um, why women have been underrepresented has found in terms of how gender inequality at different stages of the election process hinders equality among elected officials. And I want to do that looking at the US context and then looking further uh, abroad as well. In the US case, um, the early research that was done on women's representation in was, was for the most part in the US Congress, a little bit in state legislatures. And one of the first questions that they wanted to ask was why are women underrepresented? And they thought the reason was that voters aren't voting for women. But initial analysis of data found that one, when women run, they win. So if women get on the party ballot, their probability of getting elected to office is the same as men's. There's no voter discrimination in the United States against um, female candidates once they're on the ballot. So if their probability of getting elected is the same as men and there's no voter discrimination, that means that the fact that women are underrepresented in in politics is something is happening earlier on in the election process. It's not ha happening at the end of the game. So what they started to, to ask about was um, the candidate pool. So surely this must mean that women are not getting into the candidate pool to the same degree as men are. And the candidate pool would be the positions and the professions that feed into politics. So women being in elite um, professional uh, occupations such as business, such as health, uh, health care provision, um, such as, as law. So the thinking was that that was the problem. But as we've seen more and more women getting into these kinds of occupations, getting into institutions of higher education, getting involved in occupational fields that should be feeders into politics, we have not seen a comparable uptick in women's representation in uh, legislatures or in, in political office more generally. So the thinking was that the candidate pool is not the explanation here. If the candidate pool is not the explanation, it's not happening at the stage of getting women in the positions where they're qualified to run for office, and it's not happening at the election stage where voters are playing a role in choosing who's going to go into office, it must be happening at the stage of getting um, onto the party ballot or moving from the candidate stage to the aspirant pool, which means asking, which means uh, identifying the problem as being that women are not running for politics. So if women are not running for politics, why aren't they running? So there's two scholars in the U.S. who have done significant research on this, um, and my graduate students here will laugh because these are the two of their, their most favorite um, scholars in the, the, the Women in Politics class that I'm teaching this semester for them. Um, Rick, uh, Richard Fox and Jennifer Lawless uh, have done quite a bit of research on this question, trying to understand why women don't run. The re so what they did was in 2004 and 2005, they conducted a survey of US professionals. So they identified people who should be in the candidate pool and then surveyed them, asking them a series of question, uh, questions about their political ambition. And um, what they found was that there were significant gender differences in choosing to run. Women were not choosing to run for political office to the same extent that men do. Why don't they choose to run for office? First, they found that they don't consider running. It does not 
pop into their head, they don't think about running for office as something that they should think about doing. And interestingly, they found that when they accounted for um, whether individuals had received encouragement from others to, to run for office, they found that when they do get encouraged to run for offices, the gender dis uh, differences disappear. So encouragement can make a big difference for women choosing to run. The second thing that explains why they don't run for office, they found, was that women don't perceive themselves as qualified. And what they determine is that something is happening in the um, political socialization process or in the socialization process of young uh, girls, young adults, young women, uh, women in uh, business level occupations that is making them not see themselves as qualified even when they are just as qualified as are men. They found that other factors did not matter. Political culture didn't seem to explain uh, the differences in any way. Family responsibilities, work responsibilities didn't seem to explain the difference in, in, in any way. The difference really seemed to be related to the fact that women don't perceive themselves to be as qualified as men. In 2011, these same two scholars decided they wanted to push this a little bit further and they wanted to explore um, when socialization takes place and how and, and to what extent does socialization actually explain um, gender differences in political ambition. And what they found was, first they asked where did the gender gap begin? And what they found is that it appears to begin somewhere just before high school, in high school and into college. Because they found a gender gap among college students, but a weaker one among high school students. So it may be happening a little bit earlier than that, but it's happening at least as far back as that, as that point. It's not happening once women are reaching um, levels of careers. It's happening prior to that. And what they did was to uh, identify why uh, this was occurring and what they found was when they included these four factors in their um, analyses, they found that the gender gap disappeared. And so the gender gap, women, uh, it turns out that women receive less encouragement, or, or high school girls and, and college uh, women, um, receive less encouragement from parents. They have fewer political experiences as youth. Uh, they have less participation in competitive activities, and they have lower self-confidence. And so when you account for these things, the gender differences disappear. So it appears in the U.S. context that women are socialized at a young age to not consider politics as a career. And that, in part, is explaining, uh, they argue at least, why uh, part of women's underrepresentation in uh, politics in the U.S. context. Looking more broadly than the context of the US, we have to think about some different factors because elections operate differently in different countries, both the rules about how elections occur, as well as the context, the political, the cultural, the social context in which they're operating. So in comparative politics, um, we have not, there is not much scholarship that has looked at whether women are choosing to run to the same extent as men. That may well be at play here as well, but there has not been a lot of scholarship that has looked at that. Um, instead, they've looked at these three different stages of the election process the election stage, is there any kind of voter discrimination going on? Uh, the party ballot stage, are women getting onto party ballots? And if not, what can be done about that? And then also um, the extent to which cultural and socioeconomic obstacles may be occurring for women in certain contexts. And one thing that we found is that the idea that when women run, they win, does not always hold. So I did a study in um, a, a few years back where I wanted to test the extent to which there may be voter discrimination in a comparative context uh, uh, towards women. And in a comparative context, it's frequent that when voters are voting, they're voting for a political party only. So you don't always get to cast a vote for an individual candidate, you often cast a vote for a political party. So in, or in order to be able to measure uh, preferences for candidates at the election stage itself, you have to look for uh, political systems whereby individuals vote for individual candidates. And there are not that many of them, and a lot of them still have uh, high incentives for strategic voting, meaning that people aren't actually voting their preferences, they're voting for a person because they think that person has the best chance of actually winning. So I looked at three countries where both of those incentives are reduced, and we can get a real measure of a vote for a candidate as being a vote, for a vote based on preferences. And what I found was that 
context really matters. So I found in the context, and there were three cases where this was, was true. One was Ireland, one was Malta, and one was Australia. In the context of Malta, we found much what we see in the US, is that there were no differences in voter, um, in votes for men and women uh, by voters. In the Irish context, however, uh, women were significantly less likely to get preference votes than were men, all else equal. In the Australian context, women were much more, were significantly more likely to get pre uh, preference votes than were men. So there's positive discrimination towards women in the Australian context. There appears to be some form of negative discrimination against women going on in the uh, Irish context. The main point here being is that voter discrimination can play a role. Where it does will vary, uh, but we need, need to, to pay attention to that um, when we're exploring the reasons why women are not getting represented in different countries. At the ballot stage, um, it's very clear, and research shown very clearly, that women are not getting onto party ballots. And there's been a big effort um, among countries around the world to solve this problem with a fast-track fast mechanism called gender quotas. And more than 100 countries have adopted some form of gender quota, usually for legislatures, usually at the national level, that require political parties to include a certain percentage of women on their party ballots. And those gender quotas have proved to be relatively successful. If you look, if you think back to the countries that I had on that list that I said some of them at the top in terms of women's representation that were between 40 and 50 percent were not countries that you would expect to be there. But part of the reason that they're there is because they've implemented very successful gender quotas. They've implemented quotas that require women to be on party ballots. And once women have, been, have gotten onto party ballots in those cases particularly, um, we've seen them all, that, that their representation on the party ballot translate into their representation in legislatures there. So quotas have been a very uh, important solution to uh, women's uh, inequality. The last thing here is that there are contexts or countries still in the world where women uh, do not have the same access to political qualifications and political experience. Uh, for cultural and socioeconomic reasons, particularly in rural and much less developed countries, women may not have the same um, opportunities as men. They may still be operating in a very gendered division in a very in in roles that represent a very gendered division uh, division of labor so women are much more likely to be taking care of the home uh, men are like more likely to be out uh, bringing in uh, income for the family so uh, so socioeconomic factors women's qualifications experience can matter significantly as well I want to talk a little bit moving away from gender inequality in terms of, of representation in bodies and talk a little bit about gender equality inside of political institutions. This time last year, I brought some of the top scholars who are studying gender and representation in Latin America here to Rice for a conference. And what I did was ask each uh, scholar or set of scholars to work together um, on a paper and to do an analysis of women's underrepresentation or gender inequality in either a country in Latin America or in a uh, representational arena. So in the presidency, in cabinets, in legislatures, in uh, subnational governments, in political parties, and we studied a range of countries, seven different countries in Latin America. Brought everybody together for the conference, and what we learned from the conference uh, was really relevant here, and that was the gender inequality in Latin American government institutions continues to be incredibly pervasive, and that this mirrors what we see in countries in other parts of the world, and research has shown that um, there's a significant gender inequality in the interactions of politicians within institutions as well as in their behaviors. What I want to do here, um, I got the legislature's chapter because I, I uh, or the legislature's analysis because I study uh, Latin American legislatures. And we're actually uh, pulling all these analyses together into an edited uh, book right now. So when I say legislature's chapter, that's the, the chapter of the book that I'm working on. So I got the legislature's chapter. And what I thought I would do would be to present some of the data um, and analyses that I've done on gender inequality in Latin American legislatures as some of the evidence to support um, um, the assertion that there is gender inequality in, inside of political institutions. 
collected data on Latin American legislatures in three countries. So I really wanted to focus in depth on three countries and um, studied a variety of different parts of the legislative process. So a variety of different uh, ways in which legislators act. So I looked at their policy priorities, their bill sponsorship patterns, their committee participation, their participation in leadership, uh, debates, constituency service, a variety of different things that legislators um, do. And you can see here I focus specifically on Argentina, Colombia, Costa Rica. I collected the data in a variety of ways. I conducted a, a survey of legislators in these three countries to ask about things that there are not archival records of. And then I also uh, collected archival records on the bills that were sponsored, the committees that le the legislators get assigned to, and chamber and committee leadership posts. What I want to do is to highlight four particular findings. Um, oh, I should say too, the results that I'm going to show you here are um, relatively easy to interpret results, but all are based on, uh, these are, are, are predictions that come out of statistical models that include a variety of controls. So the results are gender differences accounting for a variety of other things that might explain the types of bills that you would sponsor or the types of committees that you might be sitting on. And so what I want to do is to present four different findings for you. The first one um, here has to do with differences in the political attitudes and the behaviors of legislators in these three Latin American countries. And interestingly, what I found was that there are no gender differences in political attitudes on issues that we can classify into very traditional categorizations of what should have been women's issues and what traditionally have been men's issues. And traditional thinking about what these issues were was that women's issues were things related to social affairs. So education, health were very traditional women's issues. Uh, more masculine issues were things related to the economy, agriculture, budget, and treasury. And importantly, the masculine issues are also the areas that are much more powerful. So much more power is associated with uh, masculine issues or masculine and committees um, than for feminine ones. What I found was that when I surveyed them about the priorities that they placed on issues in both of these areas, there were no gender differences. So men and women were equally likely to prioritize education, health, the economy, agriculture, budget, and the treasury as important political issues. No gender differences in the extent to which they, they viewed those as important um, areas of, of policy. However, when I looked at bill sponsorship, so when I looked at what legislators do in terms of acting on those priorities, I suddenly found significant differences in exactly the pattern that you would expect if there is some kind of marginalization of women or some kind of gender division of labor within the legislative body. That is that women were much more likely to sponsor more feminine issues, so issues related to education and health, and men were much more likely to sponsor masculine issues, so issues related to the economy, treasury, um, and agriculture. And the divide was, was, was very equally split along these two. So clearly something is happening in terms, in the transla translation from political attitudes towards political behavior. What that is, we don't know for sure, but I would suspect that part of what's going on is some kind of, of division of labor, um, either by male legislators and political parties actually somewhat um, explicitly suggesting that women focus on certain areas and men focusing on other areas, or there's some kind of socialization of legislators themselves that is pushing them to pursue um, policies in one area or another. Another place where I found very similar results in terms of behavior was the committees that legislators get assigned to. So I looked at, uh, these are, are the results specifically for Argentina, and here you can see the social committee versus the Economics, Budget, Agriculture, and Foreign Affairs Committee in the context of Argentina. And you see a very similar pattern to what I just described in terms of bill sponsorship. And that is on social issues, women were much more likely to be represented on social committees. Men much more likely to be represented on Economics, Budget, Agriculture, and Foreign Affairs. The differences are a little bit smaller uh, when we look in Costa Rica, but you still see a similar pattern of some kind of gender division of labor in this context. In Colombia, there was no difference actually in the, uh, no significant differences in, in the committee representation of um, women and men. And that part of that might be because that's actually a context where um, 
uh, individuals get to put forward what their preferences are, and there is a chamber-wide vote to decide who's going to sit on which committee. Whereas in both of these contexts, it's political party leaders or the chamber president who decides who's going to sit on which committee. So there's not as much of an opportunity for the preferences to carry through to the committee assignments. In terms of chamber leadership, um, the numbers here are very small, so these are just simple calculations of the number of uh, women who served in these offices. Um, and on the far right hand side, you see the percentage of women that served in the chamber during these terms of office. And this is Argentina in the House of Representatives and, the, uh, uh, and in Costa Rica. And you can see relatively large percentages of women, particularly as you get into the 2000s. Um, you're up to a third of the chamber being female. Uh, yet a woman had not held the presidency in either one of those contexts. In Colombia, uh, again, the, the problem is a little bit less stark. Uh, women did serve as president in 98 to 2002 in the House, and 2002 to 2006 uh, in the House as well, and in the Senate in 2002 to 2006, a woman um, served as president. Um, but the, and, and the representation of women in the chamber is much smaller there as well, which would suggest that they're doing um, uh, somewhat better in that context, even with smaller number of women being, um, in, in being present. In terms of uh, leadership on committees, um, results are, and the evidence is a little bit less, uh, less compelling, but you can see the, let's see if I can highlight it, um, see here for, this is for results for social committees, so this tells you the percentage of seats on the committee that are held by women, so that would sort of be your baseline comparison. Um, and these are just simple cross tabs with a star indicating whether the, the difference is statistically significant. So this would suggest that women are slightly overrepresented in the vice presidency and the, and the secretary positions. Um, and not a whole lot of significant differences in other uh, places there. Um, on the masculine-based committees, so your economics, your budget committees, your foreign affairs types of committees, um, you can see here not a single woman served as president during these periods of time um, on, uh, in Argentina or Colombia. Uh, as presidents. And in the Costa Rican context, interestingly, on the Foreign Affairs Committee, um, women are well overrepresented as presidents of foreign affairs committees in that context. So those are some of, of the results that I found in the context of Latin America, which suggests that women are not getting access to the same levels of political power uh, that they uh, should be to represent their numbers in office. But gender inequality in access to political power is more widespread than this as well. So we see it in other institutions in Latin America. That's one thing that we, we documented in the, the conference and the book that we're working on right now, um, is that we see these kinds of patterns. We see significant gender inequality in other institutions of government. So we see it in, the, um, in cabinets. We see it in political parties. We see it in subnational governments, albeit in slightly different ways than exactly what I documented here. Um, but there does seem to be a gender distribution of power within um, other institutions within Latin America as well. More broadly, there's research on uh, comparative legislatures, a lot of it in Europe, um, as well as in the US context, however, that suggests um, relatively uh, significant differences along these lines and um, challenges that women face in uh, particularly legislative arenas to try to gain access to power. In the US context, um, there's been a lot of research that's looked at bill sponsorship patterns. Um, it's looked at uh, committee hearings and the participation of men and women in committee hearings and the types of issues on which they engage in hearings. Uh, we've also seen, uh, there's also been research on uh, access to political networks and the fact that women don't always have access to the same political networks that men have access to. So we've seen research on that in the U.S. context. And I think most clearly in the U.S. context, uh, we can see the uh, gendered uh, nature of the political system in the current presidential election. Um, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone to think about the kinds of comments that we've heard um, politicians making. Um, and not only are these sort of generally um, inappropriate, but they have a gendered nature to them as well. Um, they're exclusionary towards, uh, towards women in a lot of cases, whether they're um, uh, commenting on someone's, uh, a political leader's wife or spouse, whether they're commenting on a female journalist, whether they're commenting on, um, 
uh, other female candidates in the race um, themselves, there's definitely a rhetoric within the election um, that is exclusionary towards women. And it's those types of things that uh, make it not all that surprising that women are opting out of considering politics um, at, at even a relatively young age. <laughs> Conclusions. Um, so in my talk, what I've tried to do is to use the numbers on women in politics to emphasize how much still needs to be done to improve gender inequality. And I don't really want to minimize the significant progress that women have made. And the numbers that I showed you at the beginning can be interpreted in one of two ways. One, we can say, wow, look how far we've come. Women have made really great progress. And that's actually usually the spin that I put on uh, those numbers when I, I give talks like this. The other way to look at it is, ugh, look how far we still have to go in terms of increasing and improving gender uh, challenges of gender inequality. But I emphasize the latter uh, perspective here and try to emphasize the extent to which gender inequality is still pervasive, in part because the Ciencia series has been about inequality. Um, if you think back to the very beginning of the fall, the first lecture we had was on inequality in careers in academia. Uh, there was a, a lecture that was on inequality in the criminal justice system. Uh, we dealt with issues of racial inequality, economic inequality here in the spring. And I think this um, final talk uh, highlights a, another important dimension to this, which is inequality in gender and politics. Gender inequality uh, in politics has made great strides in recent years, but a lot still needs to be done. Scholarly research still needs to continue exploring uh, the state of gender inequality in politics and helping policymakers figure out how to reduce gi uh, gender biases against people or among people and institutions. And in, if we do that, hopefully at some point we can have a Ciencia series that will be on questions of equality rather than inequality and hopefully be able to do that sooner rather than later. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Thanks for a, a great talk. It was very clear to non-political scientists, which is always a great mark of success in the Sancho series. Um, I was curious about your comments about the quotas, um, because it seems like there's more that can be fleshed out there. I had two questions about that. One was, has there been much longevity in looking at the effect of the quota system that has been introduced um, in legislatures? And then the second is, have there been any examples of quotas being used for appointed positions, so cabinet positions or um, court positions? Right. So yes, um, on, on the latter question first, there have been uh, a few cases of quotas being used in uh, for cabinet appointments, um, and a few in context of courts. I'm least familiar with that, so I won't say anything more about that. Um, the one country, and we were just talking about this yesterday in my graduate course as well, um, the only country that I know of for sure that has a quota for the cabinet is Colombia. And Colombia adopted it in 2000, and interestingly, it adopted a quota for the cabinet, but not for the legislature. So the cabinet quota was in place first. It has since adopted a quota for the legislature in 2011, but the cabinet was, um, was, the first, was, was where they did it, where they uh, implemented that first. In terms of the longevity of the study, there's been a huge amount of research on gender quotas. Um, and I actually was going to talk a little bit more about it, but I realized my time was running short, so I thought I'll, I'll save that for Q&A, which is perfect. I'm glad you brought it up. There's a lot that I could talk about related to gender quotas. Um, they've, been, uh, they've been largely successful. However, it depends significantly on how those quotas get implemented. And this is something that's, that's really important to talk about in terms of gender quotas. Um, there are a lot of different ways that you can implement quotas. So the first is just to say, OK, I'm going to require that, in the case of Argentina, uh, for example, in 1991, they required that 30% of the ballot be female. And so that's one way to go about it, is to just set a, a threshold that has to, to be female. And that basically means that in any given district, a political party is running in. And in most of these, these countries that have adopted quotas, they have multi-member districts. So rather than in the context of the US, we elect one person in the House, we elect two in the Senate. In a lot of countries around the world, you may elect two, you may elect five, you may elect 10, you may elect 100 if it's a nationwide district. So you can elect a lot of people in any given district. And so a requirement of 30% if the district is, is, has 10 seats available would mean that three of those 10 uh, people on the ballot have to be female. 
The problem is if you only put three people on, the, or three women on, women on the ballot, uh, if you only require 30% of, of uh, the ballot to be female, what a lot of political parties did was to say, okay, we'll put three women on the ballot, and they put them at the very bottom of the list, which meant that those women had no real chance of getting elected because no one political party wins all the seats in any given electoral district. So they might win five, they might win four um, if they're lucky, but so those women were never getting elected. So something else that they found that you have to do is include a placement mandate. So the laws have to also say women have to be placed in electable positions on the ballot, or they have to specify exactly what that um, you know, where women should be, be placed. Should they be alternating? Should it just be in the every three positions? How are they going to allocate that? Um, and then interestingly, even in countries where they have adopted relatively strong quotas like that, uh, Spain is a, a good example of this. They adopted a quota in 2007-2008. Uh, they require 40% of the ballot to be female. They require the 40% the to be applied to every five positions on the ballot. So encourage to make sure they don't all get put at the bottom, they get put closer to the top. But they don't require that ballots have to alternate male or female, or that a woman has to be at the head of the list or anything like that. And so what we've seen is that 80% of ballots still have a man at the top of the list. So political parties have, have used a variety of different strategies to try to get around gender quotas even when they've been, been put in place. So in some cases they've been highly successful. In some cases they've been, been pretty widely embraced both um, by the public as well as by um, politicians. But in the vast majority of cases that hasn't been the case. They're still working to try to find ways to get around the gender quota. Um, and so it hasn't been as, as successful as, we, as we'd like. Thank you very much for that. Uh, you were looking at political power and how much of it, how much inequality there was in political power, which makes sense, you're a political scientist. But I was wondering if you had any data to compare it with the private sector. I know there are lots, you know, there are huge numbers of female owned businesses, but I was wondering about uh, actual power uh, at the higher levels, so at, at like, you know, major corporations and so on. Is it worse in the public sector or in the private sector? I was wondering. Right, that's a good question. I don't have the data on that. Um, anecdotally, we certainly hear that it is um, pretty extensive in the private sector as it is in the, in the um, public sector. Inequality, inequality. yeah, inequality. Um, both in terms of numerical representation and in terms of, of access to real political power inside of the uh, business organizations. I mean, we know that women are not, uh, I don't have the exact data offhand, but we know that women are not serving as CEOs of the vast majority of, of companies. It's a very small number of women who are actually CEOs of um, the, the top 100 companies, 500 country, uh, companies in the, in the country. Um, so women are, are numerical representation of women um, in the top echelons of, of business is, is very small. Um, and you also anecdotally hear lots of similar um, complaints and concerns about the challenges that women face um, uh, in those environments, both in terms of negotiating um, home and, and familial uh, obligations as well as interacting with um, uh, colleagues in that um, environment. I would be hard pressed to compare it without the numbers. I'd be hard pressed to compare it to the political sector. I would leave it at, I think it's a challenge in both of those places. At this point, you've talked about numbers and differences in patterns. So let me ask you, does it make any difference at all who is in office and what representation means yes. generally? Yes, and that's, that's another good question. That's what I didn't talk about today. Um, that would be the flip side of the coin. So if I had given the opposite presentation, which was to talk about all the important reasons why we should have more women in politics, those are the types of things that I would have talked about. Um, I have data from uh, these Latin American cases. One of the things that I looked at was the extent to which women are actually making a difference. And I actually went into it thinking that I was going to find lots of ways in which women were making a difference. I found fewer than I personally would have liked, um, but as a researcher, that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, what I found was that where women are making a big difference is on bringing women's issues um, to the political arena and then actually getting work done on those issues in the 
political arena. So I show, I talked a little bit about the attitudinal differences between men and women. One place where I did find significant gender differences was on women's issues. So, and, and by women's issues, I mean things um, such as policies and issue areas that are specifically targeted at um, women and women's inequality. So that might be things related to equal rights, it might be things related to domestic violence, that might be things related to reproductive health, um, those types of issues. And I found that women placed higher priority on those issues than did men. Um, anecdotally, from interviews that I did, um, the women in the legislature often talked about the fact that, that they feel kind of marginalized on those issues because the men feel like it's not their area, and so they don't spend time on that, and so they, they sort of relegate that to the women, but it's also giving women the opportunity to spend a lot of time working on those types of issues. Um, women are much more likely to uh, sponsor bills on these types of issues. They're much more likely to get uh, uh, legislation passed on those issues. They're much more likely to sit on committees that are specific, specifically designed to focus on issues related to women issues. Um, and the, the list sort of goes on and on. That was the place where there was a consistent pattern. Was anything I asked about in terms of um, political behavior or research in terms of archival records, in terms of political behavior on women's issues specifically, um, women were much more likely to promote those things. So on one hand, I would say that that's certainly a big um, contributing factor. The other thing that I would add here too, before I go to the next question real quick, is that I think in terms of, of solving the problems of women's inequality in real political power in the legislative arena, I think the only way to solve that is for a continued push and continued inclusion of women. And I think it's not so much to include women into a um, male-dominated, very uh, sort of masculinized political arena, but to help to change the nature of that arena and make it a little bit more gender neutral such that it's inclusive for both men and women regardless of their styles um, or their um, uh, preferences in terms of, of their, their political behavior. Are there uh, viable alternatives to uh, quota systems? Are there well, methods that one can achieve goals other than the quota, or is that basically it? Right. I think what, um, what the U.S. is doing is the alternative to that, and I think uh, what I mean by that is sort of comes out of the research that Fox and Lawless have done. I think um, policymakers reading that research and saying, okay, how do we solve this problem? Would say, well, the solution then is is that we have to tap women to run for office. Um, we have to uh, reach out. Political parties have to do a better job of reaching out and trying to encourage women to participate in the process. Um, society uh, needs to do a better job of socializing uh, young women and girls to think about politics as a career. Um, reversing some of those patterns that, that Fox and Lala saw in terms of um, uh, uh, girls not participating in competitive activities to the same extent as men, et cetera, et cetera. I think those types of of social and cultural changes would be an alternative to gender quotas. And researchers have actually talked about those two things as two different mechanisms by which you can improve women's representation. Quotas are a fast track mechanism. I mean, that's a, a real quick way to get women on the party ballot while you wait for these other changes to occur. Um, sort of an incremental track mechanism is the language that's used for cultural and socioeconomic change. And I would argue that the cultural and socioeconomic change has been working. We've if we look at trends in the United States, we certainly see an increase, but it's a slow increase. And so I think governments have to make a decision about um, how quickly they want that change to occur. And um, a lot of countries around the world have decided they want to do it quickly, um, but they've decided that for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's pressure and response to women's movements. Sometimes it's an effort to um, increase international legitimacy because the United Nations is, supports gender quotas and they are pushing countries that are new democracies and developing democracies to consider um, ways to increase gender equality in um, politics. And so a lot of times countries are doing these things to try to, achieve, uh, to, try to increase their legitimacy that way. I want to thank everybody for showing up for our last uh, uh, lecture uh, of this lecture series this year. Um, next year we're going to turn from inequality, unfortunately not to equality, but we are going to turn to the concept of privacy and what that means for uh, a society. So. Uh, I'd like you to uh, join me in thanking Leslie uh, once again for a wonderful talk. Really appreciate it. 
and please join us outside for a, a quick reception. Thank you very much. <laughs>